Welcome everyone. In case you didn't know, that was Daft Punk around the world. <laughs> um, I was told that a bit earlier, I didn't know it myself. But the two, <laughs> the two, two gentlemen on my right, welcome, Andrew and Hamish, and they do go around the world. They invest all around the world. We're, we're quite um, privileged to have them here today in the same room discussing a variety of subjects. And we're going to have a look at what the world looks like in terms of markets in 10 years' time. But there is only one way to uh, look at the future, and of course in financial markets, and that's to see what's happened in the past. And that's the only way we can work out what will happen in the future, even though um, we're not allowed to rely on it, but we will. So we'll start off going back 10 years before we go forward 10 years, gentlemen. And hopefully we'll get a slide up, James. So where I'd like to start the conversation, gentlemen, is bond yields and interest rates around the globe. I remember being in New York visiting a few investors in 2013 and to a person, I would have thought I saw 10 of them, and they all said, the only thing we know for certain in markets is that bond yields are going to go up. And from that moment, they, they peaked at that time in the cycle, and as we can see, they've tried to rally a few times, but, and more recently, they've fallen off the edge of a cliff, which I think has generally surprised most people. Andrew, I'll start with you. That phenomenon, as we further we got away from the GFC, you would have thought, the world recovers, we go back to a normal, and it's been quite the opposite. That, that change in bond yields, we've got the US and Australia there, how has it impacted investing on a global scale as you do in that period? Yeah, I mean, it's been quite an extraordinary period. And as you said, 12 years ago, who would have known that negative bond yields were a, were a thing, let alone that we'd end up with 17 odd trillion dollars invested in them. But I think one of the, for the equity market, it's obviously had, um, you know, there is the theoretical valuation impact that it should have, but I think really the big deal has been we've seen a lot of money forced into equities looking for a return. They haven't come into equities willingly, and the result is that people have been looking to be in equities but to remain safe, and it's driven um, well beyond, I think, the interest rate impact, driven investors into defensive assets, the consumer staples, the utilities, infrastructure type assets, which have become extraordinarily expensive because they're perceived as being safe. Their business may be or may not be, but the valuations are certainly making a lot of them look anything but safe. And then it's also been, you know, uh, driven people towards growth. And partly with good reason, I mean, lower interest rates certainly will give you a bias in sort of revaluing longer duration assets. But again, there's been this sense of, I want the certainty in my portfolio. And I think, you know, that's been a huge thing in equities, particularly the last two or three years, that people want this certainty and they're founded in growth and they're founded in defensive type names. Just to stick with that theme for a bit though, that, but equity valuations, when you look at it as an overall market, the S&P 500's on 17, 18 times, the Australian market, not, not too much different. Valuations as a whole index, uh, are towards expensive, but they're not outrageous. They're not the tech uh, times mm. of the late 90s. What, why is that, do you think? Well, it is really about the divergence between, you know, the, the more highly valued stocks and, the, and the, the lesser valued stocks. Do my best to avoid talking about growth and value because I think they're just terms that we lose meaning in. But anyway, for the shorthand, the difference in value of uh, growth names and value names. So one of the interesting phenomena is that Lower rates imply a high valuation for every single stock, and yet if you look at the value names as defined by the S&P or whoever, they have not only sort of not been revalued, they've been devalued, um, not massively, while the growth end of the market has shot up. So what you see is in markets where there's a lot more growth in it, like the US, valuations, you know, admittedly in aggregate, they're not stretched, but within that, well, they're at the high end, but they're not outrageous but within that there are some groups that are insane like the the software as a service stocks and at the other end semiconductors servicing those very same names uh, on uh, PEs or valuations we've never really seen before. So it's been very selective mm. across the board. Hamish I'll bring you in uh, going back 10 years 2009 just coming out of the GFC you getting the business going Magellan you, you made a very wise move and, and um, you know, you, you did get into those gross stocks and it's been the pillar of what you've been able to grow the company on. Just having a look at those charts, 
if you go back to 09, could you tell us that you were picked that bonds would go like that? Or has that been a surprise and has that um, moulded the way you have gone about investing? Yeah, did, did we pick it in 09 that we would have negative interest rates now? No, we didn't. And look, I don't think anyone really picked that that was going to, uh, going to happen. But you do have to adapt as the environment's changing on you. And, and, and coming back to this valuation point and why interest rates are so important, you know, Warren Buffett refers to interest rates as the gravity of markets. And, and what he means by that is that when interest rates are low, valuations are higher because the discounted cash flows are more than when you've got low interest rates. So when you have low interest rates, asset prices are more highly valued, and when you have high interest rates, uh, asset prices are more lowly valued. And just to put this in a very simple context for people and why this is such an important issue for people to think about today, and I do think we're, we're in a new paradigm potentially uh, today, and that's always a very dangerous thing to <laughs> uh, say. Uh, a one. very dangerous <laughs> thing to say. But if we let's just say we we have an equity that could grow at four percent per annum forever. And and let's say nominal GDP growth or nominal world income growth is sitting around three to four percent. That's lower than they used to be, but let, let's say that was the world and this is hypothetical. If we go back to 09 and 08, interest rates were around 5%. It's mm. sort of before the GFC. Uh, I mean the risk-free interest rate, the long-term interest rate on long-term sort of developed world bonds. And if you took an equity risk premium, and most people would say that's around 5%, and we ignored leverage and things, we would say the market, um, how they would value that would be a 10% discount rate, and that 4% growth world would be worth a multiple of the free cash flow, and I'm saying free cash flow and not earnings, they're very different things, would be around 16.6%. Now let's lower this world from 5% to 4%. So the discount rate goes from 10% to 9%. That very same stock growing at 4% per annum is now worth 20 times its free cash flow. Now let's go from 4% down to 3%. So the discount rate comes to 8%. That very same equity is worth 25 times its earnings. And now let's go down to 3% long-term interest rates, which is above where we are today. We're at one and a half to negative long-term bond gonna rates. Do the same equation but let's say negative. we're at 3%. Um, that very same equity is worth 33 times its yeah. free cash flow. For, so for exactly the same company, and I'm simplifying things, let's say that company's growth rate hasn't slowed down because the world slowed down and that's driven interest rates lower, but for a 4% growing equity, depending your view of where we are on that chart, either that equity is worth 16 times its free cash flow or it's worth 33 times its mm -hmm. free cash flow. And Andrew and I could probably confident tell, tell you it's worth somewhere in between that range. Yep. And that is the dilemma, and Andrew cited consumer staples. Consumer staples have been re-rated uh, from sort of around maybe 18 times their free cash flows into the low 20s times their free cash flows on, on, on average. If you think that the long-term bond rates and their, and their growth rates have slowed down a bit because of some structural competitive reasons that are going on in the world, to us, many of those consumer staples don't look cheap, but they do not look expensive either if you believe long-term risk-free rates may be around 3% or, or, or so, which is above where they are, are, are today. So you do have to have a view about what's going on in the world. And I do think, I, I think for the next cycle, we're headed to zero. So I think interest rates are headed to zero around the, uh, around the world. Once we're at zero, I think they're glued on the floor. It's very, very hard to get off zero without causing a major asset price collapse, and therefore you're probably going to have to have a real inflation problem in the world, and the central banks are going to have to want to cure that and kill everybody else in the, in, in, in the meantime. Where it goes after zero is a very, very hard thing to predict. Well, they're discovering that in Europe at the moment, but we'll come back to rates because it, the future is very important there. If we go on to the next slide, um, Going back to 2009 and, and before, uh, there was distinct, um, or oh, there's a lot of commentary around, well, the American empire is dead and this is the Asian century. Now, if we have a look at that chart up there, uh, the, the top one that's the one you wanted to be in was the NASDAQ and it's just gone from left to right, upwards and upwards. And the Shanghai is the orange line below that had a great period, brief great period before it collapsed again and virtually done nothing. And so it's, it's actually worked out different to the commentary. I'm just, just wondering, 
Gentlemen, is that a surprising, if you go back to 2009, does it surprise you? And why has the Asian growth story not filtered through into markets, but the American reboot definitely has? Andrew, do you want to lead off on that one? Yeah, so I think the underlying story of Asia's um, growing dominance is very real. I mean, it is the Asian century, that's the fact, and the US, their entire behaviour around trade is this clearer sign of their decline. So that's a fact, but, and, and I don't think anyone can deny it, the issue is in a stock market there's a whole lot of other variables and I think it's a great lesson for today. At the beginning of the period, Chinese stocks were insanely expensive, mm -hmm. insanely. Today, they're trading on valuations that are a fraction of what we find for similar growth rates uh, in the US. So it's been this big derating. Um, so it's not a surprise that China hasn't performed given the valuations uh, it started out on? Uh, initially, no, because initially it, it, um, that's not a surprise, though the fact that it is derated so far is quite extraordinary. Okay. So, Hamish, have you, have you got a view on that, or, or is it still the Asian century from the last nine, ten years that we're looking at there? But for us investors in the Western world, is that how you access it in part? Is, is it through other mechanisms? It's not going to China because China is a difficult place to invest in. Yeah, I, I, I would say that I, I think you have to split China and Asia into two, two different areas. I, I do believe in the next 20 years it's the Chinese sort of 20 years uh, ahead. I think there are very powerful structural issues going on in, in China. It's a very different uh, economy in playing China. What, what this is going to be very important for the next years, and you can do it via Chinese companies, you can do it via European companies, you can do it by US companies, but what you have to be careful of of what's going on in this century and what you're seeing on these charts is something I would call capitalism without capital. And what I mean like that is the businesses that are winning are businesses that are very capital light. And a lot of the Asian companies and a lot of these companies on very low price earnings multiples um, uh, are, are companies that are very capital intensive. They could be banks. Uh, Asia and China has a lot of banks in their top market capitalization companies. They could be a lot of property heavy uh, 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 companies. They can be a lot of industrial and manufacturing. Uh, businesses, and what you're seeing in NASDAQ is the emergence of these very, very powerful companies that effectively don't have capital, and they have very powerful network effects. And there are businesses like that sitting in China that are fabulous businesses uh, as well. So instead of getting caught up exactly which country you're in, you have to decide what type of business you want to be in and then you need to be searching out those businesses on a global basis and buying the ones that you think are best value. But I can tell you, if you want to go and buy a whole lot of capital-intensive businesses and there you'll put portfolio for the next dec decade, I suspect you're going to see this gap in 10 years. You'll have cycles, but you're going to see this gap develop as well. The world is shifting. You want to be in very, very strong branded goods without capital. You want to be in network effect businesses without capital. Uh, and they exist all over the world. It just happens the NASDAQ index happens to be very, very prevalent in that type of business. Um, different indices would not show that exact same Yeah, that's trend exaggerated there. there. Yep. So just, just before we leave the past, Andrew, it, the capital structures and the access to the Chinese markets, especially around their currency, has that been an impediment? W would we have seen a different 10 years and w would, the, would the Chinese share market perform better if, say, for example, they had a floating currency? Look, absolutely. I mean, there's a long history of, um, you know, countries that try to control their exchange rate don't have full control of their monetary policy. Um, and as such, you know, I think you just introduce a risk into asset pricing. So, you know, I would never say that there shouldn't be some discount for that uh, while the Chinese are not fully letting their currency float. Though at the moment, it's, it's, you know, the movements you see day to day are actually a function of market supply and demand. I mean, we can see that relatively clearly, but still, it's not a free float. It's not an open capital um, account. And if it was, uh, when that day comes, I think you can get, get ready for a, a you know, good re-rating of that market. And Hamish, just a question on this. In regards to Australia, 
We've obviously tied trade-wise to China, but our equity markets tend to more follow what the US does, capital flows, whatever they are. Do you see that case as we go into the future still prevailing? Look, I, I think in the end, if you take the long term, the, the, the Australian equity market will reflect its fundamentals of its large companies yep. um, in, in, this, in this market. And it, it, it's not really going to reflect what's going on in Shanghai. On a day-to-day, -day, overnight basis, you see a lot of correlation, particularly with the US. But the US leads all markets on an overnight uh, on an overnight basis. Mm. Literally every market commentary, if the US goes down overnight, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, they're going, we're expecting we're going to open down today because of where? New York when you're closed, but that doesn't dictate where the markets go over the medium to the long term, and they're really reflecting the profitability of the, of the businesses. If I'm sitting here, here in Australia, the issue we have is still we have, uh, in terms of the larger companies in this, in this country, very capital-intensive businesses that I would say their long-term prospects of competitiveness are deteriorating. Um, uh, we've got emerging businesses that are doing very well. We've got some global businesses that are intellectual capital businesses and have networks around them like a CSL, and they will probably continue to do very well in the, in the long term. But businesses, I'm not going to pick out businesses because I don't think that's what we're here to do, but w there are businesses that are large in this, uh, in this country. For, for instance, I used to own quite a few banks in our global equity portfolio. Banks are some of the cheapest multiple stocks that you can find anywhere in the world, and we do not own a single bank. We cannot find a bank anywhere on the planet that we want to invest in. Because they're capital heavy? So it's because I, I just think structurally that's not where you... Where we, we, run, we run concentrated portfolios. It's just structurally not where we want to be. We want to be in high-returning businesses whose competitive advantages are increasing over time, not decreasing um, uh, over time. I don't think they're terrible businesses, um, but I don't think you're going to get wealthy in the future like you have in the past in, in, in banking stocks. And particularly in the next cycle, as interest rates keep getting crushed, I think the next cycle is painful. Whether we ultimately have some recessions after the world at the end of that cycle, that's probably not positive. But then you look at the long-term fintech disruptions and the open banking initiatives around the world and what that could do to the deposit franchises, if I'm taking a 10-year view now, it, it, it's just a, a place I find challenging. So you're asking about the Australian mm -hmm. market. We all know we've got large financials yep. in, our, in our index uh, here. But there are some very good businesses in this country uh, as well. But if the index, if I had to pick the index, what the ASX 100 is going to do versus the NASDAQ or the Shenzhen market over the next which have some fundamental tailwinds behind them, I, I'd be very surprised if the Australian market performs as well as some of the offshore um, markets. OK. Let, now, let's launch with the crystal ball now. We're going to go forward. Um, James, do we want to... That's, that's a bit of a summary. In 2009, they, they were the top... On the left-hand side there, you can see the top 10 listed companies in the world. Some themes in that. There was obviously some China companies. And there were oil-based companies. If we go forward 10 years, and as we continue with the Asian century, we see a lot of American companies and we see a lot of tech companies, which is, reflects those indexes we talk about. There's only two companies, as far as I can work out, correct me if I'm wrong, that appeared twice, Johnson & Johnson and Microsoft. Microsoft. Thank you. So big changes over 10 years. Um, the top of indexes can change quite rapidly. So a lot of those are household names now. Now, what happens in 2029 is quite interesting, 10 years out, given, given what we just talked about there. Let, let's, let's go back to where we started with interest rates. Yep. Andrew, I'll start with you. Interest rates stay low forever. Is this, is this what we've got to get used to and we've got to adjust the way we invest for it? Or are we living in a fool's paradise and, and there will be change again over a decade period? <laughs> So on, on this, I, I have a very different view to Hamish. Um, you know, we were right. I mean, we did our national roadshow in 2016. Why interest rates are going to stay for a long time yet, um, but certainly not forever. And I think that we've actually got to this incredibly strong consensus in the last two or three months with the, the crash in US Treasury yields that it's like they were climbing. We thought rates were going up and then bang, they've collapsed and now we accept this is here forever. 
Um, the next five years, I think interest rates can go higher. I'm talking back to threes and fours on the US Treasury. Yep. You know, on, on the 10-year? On the 10-year. I mean, that's where we were nine months ago. I don't think it's... I mean, I think the world looks in reasonable shape. Um, but I think longer term, beyond that five years, I think all bets are off. And it's simply this. The central banks of the world are signalling to their political masters that monetary policy has done all it's going to do. Sure, they might take short rates back to zero. That's, that's you know, the first thing that they will do. But after that, we're going to get fiscal spending. That's what the talk is everywhere. Now, it's fine if one country does it. That's not going to upset the apple cart. But if you have Europe and the US and China all trying to stimulate their economies with fiscal spending, we start to get competition for resources, both monetary and real. And we'll start to get a bit of inflation and we'll certainly get pressure in the bond markets. It'll take a bit of time for that to happen. Um, so I certainly think that in terms of the interest rate impact on equities, we've had it pretty much as good as we're going to get it today. It's absolutely accepted rates aren't going back up. I don't even believe it really when I talk about it. It's, it's really hard to accept we'll see rates higher, but I think uh, 10 year time frame, you have, to, you have to believe that we will see uh, US Treasuries in the threes and fours and possibly fives. I'm not talking about going back to nine, but you know, at least giving people some return on their money. So to summarise, m maybe rates stay low for the next few years. We get a fiscal stimulus globally. Rates start to go up because of um, the demand yeah. for those. So, and, and, and sorry, I should just add one other thing quickly, and that is what we're very clearly seeing in Europe is negative rates destroy the financial system. If you're a bank collecting deposits, that's your business, mm -hmm. and you take that deposit for nothing and then can't lend it, you will go out of business. So you cannot and they can't afford that to happen. You cannot break your banking systems by having negative rates. That is the limitation. You cannot do this ad infinitum. So just on that then, so under that scenario that you painted there, if we, if we go to the US and then maybe work it back to Australia, what kind of returns would equities get if bonds perform the way you're suggesting? Well, again, I think it comes down to which part of the market. So to give, to sort of use the sort of examples that I will talk about is that if I'm buying that uh, stock on a P of six, that's not growing. It, but I think it has sustainable earnings, or it might be growing a bit. I'm getting a 16% earnings yield up front. If it's a well-run company, it's coming to me in dividends or buybacks, or it's coming to me as they reinvest in their business and grow it, you know, maybe slowly. Those stocks, when I think about that 16% return, or I think about a, a high growth stock on 30 times giving me a 3%, but you know, maybe growing at 10% a year, Okay, 16 or 3 is my starting yield. Which matters, which is going to be hurt more by bonds going from 1.5 to 3? And I know which one's going to have the biggest valuation impact. It's the highly value, the, the one on 30 times. What's well, the opposite to what? The, the op I'm telling the opposite story of Hamish's. So I think that there, uh, at that value end of the market in some fantastic businesses, high return on capital businesses, there are some extraordinary opportunities to buy. Their growth business is irrespective of the global in, uh, environment, pretty much. Um, and I think they'll, you know, there'll be places to make money. But I think that growth and defensive end of the market where everyone's been crowding is going to have some challenges in that higher rates. All right, we'll come back to some of those names in a minute. Hamish, can you give it, paint us your picture of what, how you think bonds will perform over the, the decade as best as you can and the impact that will have on equities? Yeah, well, Matthew, I've changed my view. I've probably been for five years calling the typical end to, uh, to a monetary cycle and that we'd start to see rates being let out by the United States. And last year, we were in 20% cash. We've been in cash for a while. We were very defensive. We did very well last year versus markets. And coming into the beginning of this year, the Federal Reserve changed its view and effectively said we're not increasing uh, rates and I really was trying to 
think about this. And when you've been speaking publicly, being very, very cautious of inflation and wages growth and rates coming back, and we're sitting there very defensive, and we did it back in 2016, and people really want to study it. We underperformed in 2016 relative to the market. We made people money, but we underperformed relative to the market. And that's because the Fed stopped increasing interest rates after the first rate rise in December. 2015, and I, I, I said to the team, I was expecting rates would go up, a, we'd have another two or three rate rises this year, and we had a whole series of sort of lower growth defensive equities that we were going to invest in, that we thought would come off in price when, when, when rates came up. And it, it, to me, it was a bit like Mike Tyson going into a boxing ring who says, everybody has a plan until you step into the ring and then you get punched in the face. And that's what it felt like coming into 2016, where we're sitting really defensively, waiting for these rate rises, and the Fed suddenly says, cancel that, 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 that plan. So we've been thinking a lot because that was not in our viewfinder, that, 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 that scenario. And so I spent a lot of time speaking to, to, to central bankers, and I have two who are, who are now consultants um, two of them. One is a woman who knows a little bit about um, uh, monetary policy who, who we speak to. Uh, her name's Janet Yellen. And the, uh, the, the other one is a man called Kevin Walsh. And Kevin was on the Fed during 2008, 2009 with Ben Bernanke. And he was the other person who was interviewed to be the Fed chair uh, when Jay Powell got the job. He got interviewed by Trump. And many people pick he will be one of the next Fed uh, cheers. So, so I asked them both, I said, "Is what would your expectation be of what the US 10-year Treasury is going to average over the next decade and why? Um, this is recently. This is recently, yeah. This is after February this year. And, um, and they both said independently, I didn't have them both together, I was seeing them separately, and they both settled, I don't want to give you their exact numbers, but let's say they settled, we think it's going to be around 3% for the next decade. And our central estimates are now not that long. We were at five at pre-GFC, we went four and a half, we were then at four. We're now sitting a little bit above three in our central valuation analysis. And they were very influential. And, and one of those, and, I, and the reason I'm using one of those because it's confidential, I don't want to put words into either of their, uh, their, 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 their mouths. Um, one of those people then said to me is, Hamish, you need to understand, and this was many months ago, that every major central bank is going to start aggressively cutting interest rates now, and your scenario of increasing interest rates is just incorrect. That's just not going to happen. Uh, and he went through the cases of why they're going to be do it, and, and uh, he may have, or she may have gone through that, uh, <laughs> go through their case. And also, one of them also made, made, made a comment that, you know, while I'm saying three is a central estimate, do not get zero to two out of your estimates. And that's a very important thing. And of course, we've had this risk because people expect something called the Phillips curve is going to kick in, that when you get super low unemployment, you get enough tension in the economy for wages to start to rise, and you get a classic inflation. Mm -hmm. So you've got this scenario outside that you get the classic tightening with the Phillips curve and you get inflation. You've got this issue where you've got this competitive dynamic that central banks, because of this low growth world, are competitively cutting their interest rates. It's going to drive us to the floor. And then you've got this scenario of what they're going to average over the, over the long term. Out of all those scenarios, do I know which one's going to happen, whether we're going to get inflation and higher rates or we're going to go to zero to two? No, I don't know what's going to happen, but I can tell you those scenarios are very, very different to what your returns are going to be. And to back yourself into one of these scenarios could be disastrous for you. So you have to have your eyes open and you have to adapt and change with everything. At the beginning of this year, we adapted and changed. And we moved out of our defensive position because we said we're now incorrectly positioned. This will keep evolving over time. So I don't know what's going to happen over the 10 years. We're getting the best expert advice we can. We don't necessarily agree with it all um, uh, that we get. And at the moment, you know, we're positioning our portfolio. The ideal portfolio in our world isn't equities with low PEs and, and, and high free cash flow yields. Um, modest growth 
is the most valuable thing to hedge yourself in, the, in this world. And when I say modest growth, why it's so important, if you can find a business and it's very hard in this world, I'm not talking about growing at 40% a year, if you can find a business that could grow at 6 to 8% for the next 10 to 20 years, and there are not many of them, but they do exist, in this lower interest rate world, there's something known as a Petersburg paradox, that as you get the growth rate and the discount rates converging, their valuations mathematically start approaching infinity if the growth rate goes on for, for, for long enough. So if you can find businesses that have structural long-term tailwinds behind them, where they're taking market share on a global basis, that drives you above the growth in this very low growth world, if we get to interest rates of called two to three, those things which may be trading at 25 times earnings at the moment are an absolute bargain. And if it turns out we get 4% interest rates, they're going to do less well, but their inherent growth rates are going to patch over most things over, uh, over time. So we're, we're just really to find some very unique businesses that have what I call that moderate growth profile um, over, over time. They're very, very hard to find. Okay. Very good. I've got to say, I've got to revisit Janet and Kevin and see if they say the same thing to me. But anyway, maybe, maybe they won't. <laughs> um, so, OK, let's, let's start to get into sectors or areas you might, given that environment, where you might make money. Let's get back to the Asian century and maybe tie some of these um, themes together. Uh, Andrew, what, what does China offer as a growth, or maybe even greater Asia, but let's stay with China for the moment, as a growth option. Obviously, it's been a very capital-intensive growth um, period for them, and we know that the, there's been a lot of commentary, a lot of effort to get the consumer in China as a bigger part of their economy. Can you elaborate what you see there and what the opportunities might be? And uh, yeah. Feel free to add some names in what, what might be best exposed to that. So, uh, absolutely. So I think, I think also the idea that Asia has been this capital-intensive thing is a, is a misnomer, and you'll, you'll you know... I think in the, the stocks I'll quickly mention, which we see as an fantastic plays on, on the Chinese consumer. One is um, Ping An Insurance, leading life insurance business in China. There's really only one competitor, AIA, all the other state competitors really not in the game. Uh, second in general insurance, interesting banking business, leading or one of the, the leading fintechs in the world with their fund at, uh, and peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms healthcare software uh, and apps. I mean, this is just one of the most extraordinary companies, grown at 20% per annum for 20 years. Now, that's a complete rarity, growing at 20% last year, 20% this year, uh, and you can have it on nine times earnings, right? <laughs> now, it's, it's a life insurance business, certainly has capital uh, requirements, um, but it's very, you know, we're talking ROEs uh, in the mid-20s. So that's, that's one opportunity and, you know, I think the most... If that was a US stock, it would be on 30 times. Mm -hmm. um, we have then two better-known names. I think they made the list uh, as top 10, Alibaba. Um, it is the Amazon, if you like, of, um, of China, but it's far more than that. It has positions across um, payments, one of the biggest payments companies in the world, um, really second to Tencent, which is the other one I'm going to mention. Uh, but they have positions in all of the things uh, that we associate with e-commerce. Um, video streaming, food delivery, uh, Uber. They've got strong positions in all of these. Um, and, and the thing's on 25 times. So, you know, it's making money, unlike Amazon, and it is growing like crazy. Uh, Tencent you know, called the Facebook of China. It's far more than Facebook can or ever will be. I mean, they are the innovator in social media. It is what Facebook are copying continuously. So they have, um, you know, the leading gaming platforms in the country and the leading game uh, developer and producer, um, leading payments. They also are the leader in food delivery, video streaming, you name it. They're in all of these things. This one's a little more expensive. Um, also, you know, growing in the 20s and you have to pay around 30 times today for it. Um, both these stocks are well off their highs 
given the concerns around China uh, over the last 12, 18 months. So from that, I gather you are a believer that over the next decade, the Chinese consumer is, is going to be a, a crucial part for growth in the world and, and that will continue to evolve as a group. Oh, I mean, there's, no, I, there's no question about that. I mean, that's just this, I, I don't see why they wouldn't continue to be. And I think that, you know, one of the issues is that the best positioned companies to take advantage of this are clearly the domestic brand names. They are far more dynamic in their approach to business and the Chinese consumer than the foreigners uh, will ever be. Okay. Hamish, you've, you've picked some growth, great growth areas in the last uh, period, whether it be... Um, digital marketing, whether it be cloud, your view on the Chinese consumer and its role, uh, I know you're bullish on it, its role as a group going forward over this decade and, and the role it will play, and then obviously how do you get exposure to it, Where, what's the best way to play it? Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's absolutely right and I agree with Andrew, we're, we're making a big rotation into the Chinese consumer um, in, in that, so in addition to our payments and the advertising space and, and cloud infrastructure, hosting and others, which we see structural growth, I think the Chinese consumer. And why is it so important is you, you have to look at the, the pyramid of the Chinese uh, population. At the bottom of that population is six or 700 million people who are still living in, in rural areas in China. They're probably urbanising at a rate of around 30 million a year. As you move up the, the pyramid, you start to get in the middle class. There's estimates that the middle class may be around 600 million, depending on what the income cutoff levels, and all different people do it at different income definitions, but maybe 600 million consumers over the next decade at the income level that would justify consumption levels at the middle class may be doubling to 600 million. So, uh, so you're talking about a doubling of that. But as you move up the, um, uh, the pyramid, you start getting into... Uh, what you call the affluent middle class, and the definition of income, maybe there's 50 million consumers in the affluent middle class, that in the same time period, the estimates that we've got is maybe moving to 200 million, so that's 4x. And then if you look, look at the affluent consumer in, 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 in China who could buy luxury goods, that's around 10 million people today, and the estimates that's moving to around 60 million people. So as you move up the pyramid, you're looking at the middle class doubling, the affluent middle class 4x, and the affluent at the top 6x. Uh, this, is kind of, this isn't a world that's not growing. So the question is, is how do you participate um, in that? You can participate in some great businesses like Alibaba, and I can disclose today that Magellan is one of the top 10 shareholders in the world in Alibaba. Uh, we would easily be the largest shareholder in Australia in, 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 in Alibaba, and I completely agree with Andrew. It is dirt cheap and strategically incredibly well positioned for, uh, for what's going on. The scale of this business, it's probably about 900 billion US dollars in sales across its e-commerce platforms in China. Um, Amazon is 450 million. So it's twice the size of Amazon. Uh, we, we could go into its business in, in, in detail. I agree, I, I agree with that. Then there, there are other Chinese businesses that are strategically um, well positioned. We don't own Tencent, but I don't disagree with Andrew that, that, that Tencent's a very good um, business as well. I don't exactly compare it to Facebook. I think it's quite a different business to, to, to Facebook, but it's a, it's a good business. Um, but then we, we're, we're accessing different parts of the pyramid. So if you want to go to the affluent middle, the affluent area, um, uh, Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy, second wealthiest guy in the world, Bruno Arnault, if I want to disclose, we're a top 10 shareholder owning LVMH as well uh, in, in, in the world. One third of Louis Vuitton's sales are to Chinese consumers around the world. Their largest business, which is about 60% of their business, is their leather goods and fashion accessories, the two monsters they own are Louis Vuitton and Christian Dior in, in, in that business. They've got a very large cosmetics business, they've got a very large alcohol business, that's where the Moet Hennessy, so of course they own Moet, people may have heard of a brand called Dom Perignon and Verve Clicquot and Ruin Art and, and the Hennessy uh, 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 cognacs, then they own the world's largest um, uh, distributors in duty-free stores, DFS. And if you understand the, the Louis Vuitton brands, when you go through a DFS, all the prominent ones happen to be owned by them. They own a cosmetics business and a distribution business, and it's been driven by China, and that China business is growing well over 20% a, 
a year, we own Estee Lauder, or a third of its business, uh, is into sort of the middle and affluent uh, and the middle upper class of, of China. And of course, we made a large business into investment into, into Starbucks, where we'd be a top five shareholder in, in, in Starbucks. And over 50% of their profit growth in the next decade is going to be opening stores in, in China. So I completely agree, but we, we, we've got US businesses, we've got European businesses, and we have Chinese businesses. We're picking off the pyramid. And I don't agree that only Chinese brands. There is no way there's going to be a Chinese luxury brand developed in the next 100 years, probably, because there has not been since 1776, <laughs> which was independence in America. We, we the Americans <laughs> have not managed to develop a, a luxury brand since independence. It is very, very hard to develop a true luxury brand. Most of them have got heritage out of Europe. They may well do it. I'm joking a bit, but yeah, it's very, very it. hard to develop that true sense of lux luxury. Hold on, Andrew, you got to write a reply. Oh, they, they do have a thing called Muay Thai, which in there is clearly one of the world's strongest brands. There, it's an incredible company. Spirits. Incredible company, margins but, uh, off the chart. So I think there'll be Chinese heritage is going to be an important element, but. But I'm not talking about the companies you mentioned, but the normal, the Procter & Gamble's, I think, are on a hiding to nothing in China. But that's so, another story. Yeah, I, I think you pick the ones that truly are special to the yeah. Chinese, and maybe Procter & Gamble aren't special to All the right. Chinese. We, we've got one more quick question. I think we want to open it for a couple of questions in the audience. Which, um, but just, just a couple of words from each of you. The role Australia plays in the China consumer growth story. We've had a, a very strong role to play up to this point, but as the Chinese economy evolves and the consumer becomes more prevalent rather than the heavy spending on, on iron ore and coal and so on. Do we have a role to play? Andrew, do you want to...? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we are a favoured destination for travel, uh, a favoured destination uh, for study, uh, for education. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, these are two very strong parts of the, you know, our, our exports are growing very quickly. Um, so it is, it is more than iron ore and, and coal. And uh, I think um, while we're stuck in an awkward position with what the US is doing, um, clearly they would be a competitor that is, you know, making uh, all the moves they're making are helping us out in that regard. OK. Hamish, same question to you. Yeah, I, I would agree with Andrew. I, I think we have to focus on our competitive advantage. Are we going to have massive consumer brands coming? Maybe we could have some dairy brands or something because of, because of our agriculture sector. I do think the big sectors, we can, if there's a massive outbound tourism industry, probably the growth in global tourism, that's probably 50% is going to be driven by China in terms of where the expenditure is going to be coming. We could invest massively. We are a destination, but I actually think our, our, our tourist experience we offer in this country is crap. Mm -hmm. um, at, at, at the end of the day, I get lots of people who want to come to the prestige market and where do I go where I could get a great experience? And I say, go to New Zealand. Yep. Um, um, and, 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 and we should really be investing. I think our education uh, sector is absolutely massive. Our universities have, have gone after this. I think our governments have to be uh, uh, smart. Uh, and, about and that, go after your competitive advantages. Uh, in a listed sense, it's actually quite hard. There are not massive um, tourism or educational um, uh, businesses. Healthcare is another place where we could export, effectively import patients and, and other things in, in healthcare. Chinese mm -hmm. are very, very concerned about the quality that they get as they mm -hmm. go up the income uh, uh, bracket. Some Asian countries have done very well in sort of exporting those healthcare uh, services to bring patients in from um, uh, China. So I think we need, we need some long-term planning, we need to think about it, that Chinese consumption uh, and the scale of the expenditure over the next 10 to 20 years coming out of China is going to so be So if, if we're good enough, we can do something about it.